I'm really honored, I should actually say, I suppose, humbled to be joined by renowned wildlife photographer Stephen Brooks. And Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> You've literally just got got back. You've been traveling the world. Just, you know, share a bit where you've been. The yeah, last... um, we traveled to Botswana, um, Ethiopia and Tanzania for a very high profile shoot. Um, and we were there for five weeks, sweltering heat. Um, it's good to be back. <laughs> so, I mean, we're sitting here in about 34, 35 degrees. So this is nice and cool for you at the moment. Add another 10. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you've traveled to some really unique destinations to share, but you know, with us. Um, some of my favorite places on this planet is um, uh, definitely Iceland is high up that list. Wow. Um, Iceland is a spectacular place, um, especially for photography. It's just, it's just such a photogenic location. Um, Okavango Delta, mm. next on the list, it is the ultimate wilderness. Um, if you, I don't think you can take a bad photograph there. <laughs> it is yeah. just, Spectacular. Zimbabwe, mana pools, places like that, also spectacular. And those are just literally on our doorstep, on our doorstep. As, as South Africans. Three hours flight in either direction, you'll be able to, to get there. Fantastic. Um, and how long have you been doing this? You're, I've probably about 12 years now. The photography has been, um, started taking photos when I was very young, um, but got into it professionally 12 years ago. So you, you always had a passion, but before photography, what were you, I mean? I was a sound engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I was a sound engineer for 20 years, and um, but always had a camera with me. Okay. And uh, decided to, to leave the industry and find something else, uh, find a new challenge. And took up photography full time. Um, started with the odd weddings and things, and it wasn't really satisfying. I mean, I, got out into the bush and actually spent time with animals. Um, I quickly figured out that I've actually got a talent for it. Spotting moments, spotting mm. little nuances that happen in the, in the animal kingdom. And uh, that sort of brought me to where I am now, being a wildlife documentary filmmaker. Um, but the photography is always there. It's always part of it. You can take a photo, you can film it. Yes. Photography is my passion. Um, it just so happens to be that filmmaking ties in really nicely mm. with it. So Stephen, what's one of the most memorable sort of shoots that you've been on? Um, the best shoot that I've ever done um, was definitely um, Disney commissioned us to do a, a show on elephants for um, Disney Nature. The show is called Elephant, narrated by Meghan Markle. Um, we spent five years in Namibia, ach, in Botswana. Okay. Um, five years? Five years. Wow. Um, we followed a herd of elephants from the Okavango Delta to Namibia, all the way through to um, Zimbabwe and Zambia and back into the Delta. And, you, the and you're living region. in a tent and so yep. on? We, we basically follow them and we camp out at night and we pack up the camp the next day and we just carry on following them. Um, but it, it was an amazing, incredible experience being able to spend that much time with them and learning from them and seeing how they work. And how big is your crew? I mean... Um, we're usually a crew of about eight people. And then that doesn't include the camp staff. Okay. That helps us with setting up camp. We, we don't have enough time to actually do it ourselves. So yeah. We have to take people with to do it for us. Um, but we've had some pretty hairy experiences where lions chased um, a zebra through the camp where the, um, they took down a, a zebra on top of one of the camera I means tents with him stuck in the tent while we weren't You in mean camp. he's actually in the tent? He's sleeping. Lions kill a, a zebra on top of his tent. We're out of camp. Oh my gosh. Ten hours later we return to a, a campsite that's been destroyed and a flattened tent covered in blood. And we went, oh my word, what, what happened? And the lions were there and we thought the guy died. And then um, he came, he got the lions away, opened the tent up and there he's fast asleep in the tent with a zebra on top of him, covered in, <laughs> covered in zebra blood. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, other stories, I mean, we, we filmed the entire um, 
of uh, the wild dogs and lions had an altercation because it was an elephant carcass. So they were basically talking, screaming at each other, get out, get out. Yeah. Was, dogs don't want anything to do with the carcass. They've got 12 puppies that, yes. are, that they need to worry about. And um, in this chaos, the other eight wild dogs managed to get the pups out of the den with the lions there. And they moved them five kilometers away to a new den site. And oh. it's never been captured with, from the air with a drone before. And we managed to capture the entire sequence um, in one shot. And it was just the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And that must form the basis of a lot of that academic research is then done on and things like that. Yeah. Because, as you said, that might not have previously been captured. Mm -hmm. That now forms the basis of scientific papers yeah. and, and so on. We, we did an interesting study where people, um, the, the B BBC and Oxford, um, contacted us because we had aerial footage of sharks with great whites coming in to a seal population. Um, but they've never seen it from the air, what, it, what happens. And we found out that the seals, actually the bigger seals all jump in the water and then herd the shark, the great wow. white, and then get it away from the pups. And they literally, they bite it. They bite it on the tail. They bite Amazing. it all over there. The sharks can't do anything to them because they're too fast. Yeah. And then they get the shark out of there. And they all they mob they basically just mob the shark and the shark goes away, and they've never seen that. So it's interesting. They we, and we give them all the footage mm -hmm. so that they can study it. And so we help. You know, we we do something that's worthwhile at the end of the day. You out there, you watching what is transpiring in front of you. It must be at times difficult not to not to actually get involved or intervene. Unfortunately, um, it's nature, and we can't intervene. Um, it's it's just it goes completely against the grain of what we stand for. Are there and situations though where you would potentially? Yes. <laughs> so my our rule is if it's a natural, like for instance, a baby elephant gets stuck in mud. If it's a mud pool, that's a natural mud pool. We cannot intervene. Okay. We need to let nature take its course. If it's a man-made mud pool that would have never been there, that wouldn't have been there, okay. and they've got a pump pumping water into the mud pool constantly, and the mud pool doesn't get dry like it's supposed to, yes. and this baby gets stuck, we will intervene. Okay. Um, and we have. So if it's so, man-made intervention, then you would? Yeah, okay. if it's man-made, we will intervene. Um, there's, no, there's no water pumps and bore oil pumps in the delta. In Yes. The wild. All, it's, it's all natural. It's all natural. The, pump, the pool gets wet, the pool dries up. And that's a reason, there's a reason why it happens. Just talk us a bit through the preparation that you would get through to where we are sitting here. Sitting here. Yeah. Um, I, I usually start a couple of days before I need to go and do a shoot. Um, just mentally preparing myself where I'm going to be. Need to find out where I am, where are we staying, what, what are we doing, what times. So it's all the logistics. Mm. I need to get my head around that. Um, and then I slowly but meticulously make sure that my, my equipment's together. Okay. Um, make sure that all the batteries are charged. Make sure that all the lenses are clean. Make sure that all the cameras are working. Make sure that all the cards have been cleared. Um, so that there's no, when you get to the shoot, there's at no point where you, which battery is, which battery is empty and which, you know, it just creates chaos. And particularly where you can't even now charge a battery and things like that. Exactly. So always make sure that you got enough batteries to last you two days. Um, well, that's what I do. And uh, enough cards to sink a battleship <laughs> because you're going to take photos um, and lots of them. So that, that prep for me is, is, is the, it's sort of the groundwork or the foundation mm. for a successful shoot is making sure that your stuff works. Um, it, it's annoying when you get there yes. and the camera doesn't work. And of course there's also, I mean, yeah, you're going to be out in the heat. I mean, the wind is, thank goodness the wind is blowing quite a bit, you know, with the heat that we've yeah. got. So, I mean, it's also that in addition to your equipment, it's also your own physical preparation yeah. that you need to... Um, get plenty of rest. Um, you, you, you have to be rested. Um, and you have to be hydrated. So and I know sunblock. I mean, I've I've made sure that I'm covered in it. You know, going into the heat and that, yeah, and that's definitely. and that sort of stuff becomes because if you don't have that, and I can imagine as you waiting for that perfect shot, 
it can you, ruin it. It could ruin it. It could ruin it. Um, you could get heat stroke, you get sun stroke. It, it's just, it's all looking for trouble. Um, so make sure that you put a hat on, cover yourself. It's, it's not a fashion show out there. It's basically <laughs> just, it's hardcore bush and you have to, you have to make sure that you keep yourself protected. Guide me through it as a photographer. Do you, do you wait for that perfect shot? Do you take multiple pictures? How? If you work with animals a lot, you, you, you film um, or photograph, let's say for instance, elephants. Mm. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with elephants. Um, so you, you, what, what you'll do is you, you'll pick up their behavior. So there's definitely a, a distinct behavior that if, if they see water, they're going to go towards it. Okay. That's 100% every single time they will go for the water. Um, I will sit and wait until I think, okay, now they, there's a good moment. There might be a, a smaller elephant that plays with a bigger mm. elephant. or But you, you'll pick it up. You'll see when it happens. Um, but I don't go and just... Take multiple shotgun just click it. clicking no. away. No, I won't just hold the shutter button down and let it finish a card. Mm. It's, it's very, uh, I'll take multiple shots, but uh, 10, for instance, mm. instead of 100. Even though we've got the digital cameras and technology, yeah. sometimes you go back to the basics. Just talk us through that. Yeah, so um, I've got the saying is everybody's a good photographer and take, until they take the camera off auto. Um, and with digital cameras made us lazy because you can take a photo, oh no, take a photo, oh let's change that, take a photo, and it's that mm. instant gratification. Um, it's really good to find an old film camera that you can put a roll of film in and not be able to see what, what the quality of your photos or what the photos look like. Because you can, if you're particularly out in the, in, in the field like now, yes. you're going to have to wait to get back to, um, to, the, city to the city and then develop the film and then see your photos, yeah. Um, it, it, it ups your skill level tremendously because you'll, then you'll start learning about shutter speeds and you'll start learning about the settings on the camera. Cell phone cameras have made us lazy, digital cameras have made us lazy and it's a really good exercise just to go back, go back 20 years. <laughs> I think that's so invaluable and it, uh, it's, you know, it's not just in photography yeah. but I think it's in all the different art forms that we've, we've shared and we've spoken about how important it is to always go back to one's foundation and the basic, yeah. your, your basic skill set that really that everything else is not built on. Yeah. You've been nominated for a number of awards and um, and so on. Yeah, um, a lot of our, the, the shows that I've done, and a lot of it's on Netflix um, and on BBC. Um, I've been nominated for BAFTAs. Okay. Um, I haven't won any yet. <laughs> it's an incredibly competitive market. Yes. Um, but we've got two nominations for this for next year's BAFTAs, Fantastic. Um, which is which is a good thing. It's all time as we get something. At least. And you've got a lot of your works but, um, that are hanging in people's houses yeah. and so on, your photographs and, and as yeah, such. Yeah, I, I, for me it was never about selling the photos but um, it, people started taking notice and you know, I am selling okay. my, my, my pictures. I'm selling big one, one of one prints um, that's signed with certificates and a backstory mm. on what it's all about. Um, I'll sell some of the prints, smaller prints with like 10 of, um, and they've all got a very special story. Yes. So each and every photo, I remember exactly where it was. I remember what happened. I remember how I took that photo and the story behind it is what, where the magic is, um, okay. is how we got it. And one of the things that I understand you've also been delving into is around um, non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Yeah, it's an exciting space. <laughs> Um, I've sold three of my photographs on a um, NFT marketplace on OpenSea, um, and I'm minting more. Wow. It seems like people want it, and they one of ones. If that photo goes, there'll never be another one like it. Um, I can print it myself and hang it in my house, <laughs> but I can't sell it. And one of the advantage <laughs> of being sort of in in the NFTs is even if that photo resells again multiple times. As the original artist, there's a percentage that does come back to you. Yeah, you get a you get a ten percent commission every time the photo sells for the life of the photograph, um, and that means forever, basically. Fantastic. As long as the blockchain exists, that photo will exist. Because that's been one of the challenges with artists, where their works tend to then 
still years later on the secondary market yeah. and you know the, the 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 buyer benefits but the artists themselves never yeah the 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 nice thing about it is um is the guy the, there's so much money involved in the nft space and we're so early and it, i still don't know everything about okay. it i'm still learning and i'm just like I'll, I'll take a photo and that's a photo i can let go of that photo um and put it on the marketplace. Yes. And if it sells, so be it. If it doesn't sell, if it sells for a little, it doesn't matter. Somebody's got a piece of my work in their home or it's somewhere in the cloud, <laughs> somewhere on the internet. Um, and they're happy with it. Like somebody cared enough to actually purchase it. So one of the things that I want to do with, with the NFT space, which would probably I'd be able to, is I want to set up a fund or a trust um, type of situations where I, I want to teach kids wildlife photography in particular and be able to take them out to the bush um, and teach them how to photograph animals, teach them how um, animal behavior works, teach them how to look after the environments that we live in and sort of so that they can pass it on to future generations. It starts with the kids and the kids will, will the kids need to know that it's not okay to poach. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to burn. It's not okay to rip out plants and destroy things. It's not okay. Um, these animals have got more right to be there than we have. We have. Um, so it's it's about protecting them. It's one hundred percent about protecting mm -hmm. nature and protecting the environment. Any person wanting to get into photography, what what would be your advice for them? Um, get a camera. Um, you've got a, you, you're, the best camera that you've got is the one that you've got on you, which is your phone. Um, just start taking photos. Um, learn, to watch tutorials, engage with professional photographers. Mm -hmm. I'm open to anybody contacting me on social media. And if they want to meet up for coffee, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but you've you got to create a dialogue with them okay. because we've got tips and tricks that mm. you can't learn in in school or learn in a college or learn in a, a photography school um, but it's perseverance you've got to push through it's tough it's tough you got to be as tough as nails to actually do it but, but rewarding i mean oh, i, I mean you, some of your stories the places you've been to yeah. <laughs> and people must look at you and think well I actually want Stephen's job. I want to be that man out there in the field. It's definitely not glamorous, but it's worth it. <laughs> you're going to get cold nights. You're going to get bitten by bugs. You're going to um, just hot days and sweaty days and dirty days. And it's all worth it. But I'll do it all over again. But I think to anyone, any career, and also to our, any other artists that are actually watching as well, if you, if you have a passion, follow your passion. But mm. at the same time... It takes a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, yeah. but ultimately it is rewarding. Blood, sweat and tears. That's it. Blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much. No but, problem. you know, let's go out and actually... Let's go find some Ellie. Let's go find some Ellie. I can see some Impala walking in the distance and they're already the coming down to the, the dam. So um, let's, go, let's go do this. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Bam, 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 bam,